You can either do that by sharing it yourself or you can email me if you want to do that. Um, we will look at your fung fungus and either listen to you tell us about it or we will try to do an identification on it if we have enough information there. Um, so we usually get a queue going. So if people want to start typing into the uh, chat function, putting your name in there. Um, I have Susan already. She emailed me a while ago, ready to go. Um, a couple other people emailed me too. So, but just start typing in if you have stuff to share. That way we get an idea of how much time we have to need to allot to everyone so we can share the time and everyone get in there. And finally, if somebody could um, volunteer to type the names into the chat function, that way we can see the names too instead of just hearing them. So with all of that being said, oh, I do have a couple of announcements too um, concerning lectures. I just have to find my way back to my one second. I am check out. Wait, anyway, I don't need to get back there. I can, I have it all, all, all remembered. Um, so I wanted to just go through the lectures that are coming up tomorrow night. James. Mitchell Cameron, no, James Cameron Mitchell, who was a student. Tomorrow? Are you sure? I, oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Tomorrow, see, I, see, I should have pulled up my list. I accidentally closed my list. No, I'm sorry. Tomorrow night is John McLeodie, How to Quit Your Job and Devote Your Life to Mushrooms. That's tomorrow night. So you guys all should have gotten an email about that. The 19th, the 18th, Next Friday, not this Friday, coming up next Friday, that's James Mitchell on resin colus ascomycetes. So uh, mushrooms that like to eat resin of pine sap. So we have those two coming up in December. And then next month, um, I don't have the dates in front of me, but they were in um, they were in the email that went out, you know, the upcoming events. John Dawson will be doing a um, slime mold lecture uh, somewhere in the middle of the month. And then somewhere towards the end of the month, we have Al, um, Alden Dirks, who's a doctorate student at the University of Michigan, doing a uh, introduction to crust and then kind of segging into um, the ecology of crust. So crust are one of his specialty. We have all that coming up. All right. So with all that being said, I guess we're ready to get started. So Sue, do you want to uh, take it away? You are muted, so. Susan, you're muted. Yeah, I got it now. Okay. Good. Now I have to hit the share screen. Oh, look at that. Okay, now what do I do? Share. Okay. Can you see anything yet? Oh, yeah. Very nice. Yeah, this is, uh, we talked about last week, um, uh, Dave thought he had Cortinarius malacorius. This is, uh, I took, oh, probably a couple of years ago, I forget when, but the, the main features besides the bright yellow thick sort of stem is the sort of greenish color inside, very orange gills, right? Now, I have another picture that's lighter than this, but it tends to be this kind of orange all over. And of course, the usual Cortinarius stuff with conifers it tends to be a boreal thing, I think. Now the trick here is if I can get another picture up. <laughs> Stop share. Let's see. Now I have to go back to this to see if I can. Yep. A more <clears throat> that picture was probably a little um, wet. So okay, I got another one here. Let's see if I'm getting the procedure right. Oop, oop, wrong one. And share. I had a group the other day. Okay, can you see it now? Mm -hmm. This is this one's lighter orange, but still the same thing. It might even be from the same exact place where the other one was growing. I have about four spots up here that I look every year. And because it is such a good dyer, I like to check them all the time. But we also talked about the difference in color between wet and dry, this one being a lot drier. So anyway, I think that's a gorgeous fungus. And it also is a fabulous dyer. 
Now, let's see if I can. N nice photos, Susan. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That, that they were both um, field guide quality and better than any of the others I found online, to be honest. Well, I try and do that um, only because, all right, I'm trying to do, do another one here. Let me see if I can figure out how to do this. Um, some of us remember when Roger Phillips was here. So we watched him a lot and how he took pictures, which is why I always try and turn something upside down. In this case here, can you see this is semi-sanguineous? Yes. Yeah, class, classic um, semi-sanguineous. Yeah, the red. Mostly yellow, but with the pinkish reddish gills. Well, yeah, to, um, well, red, red, usually. This one might have been there a couple of days. The interesting thing here, I had somebody make a comment that it was more yellow than usual. These are particularly dry. The other identifying feature is the red flush down at the stem, uh, down at the bottom here. Um, this is how I like to see them, bunches at a time. But anyway, that was this year. And then- I, I, My understanding is that the, the red stain on, this, on the base of the stipe is, is not evident, at least not in all of the varieties of semi -sanguine. Correct. I think that's correct. I was surprised about six years ago when I was in Estonia with the Danish men, as I call them. They, they had three or four different kinds of things that if I had not seen them together, I would have said they each one was Cortinarius semi -sanguineous. But when you saw them together, they looked very different. And yet they all had the red gills and one had a much thicker stem. The other one was maybe more uh, uh, brown colors in the, in the cap. Now, I just want to show you one other picture if I can figure out how to do it still. I, I seem to be having good luck at the minute. Okay, I just have to follow the strips of how to do this. Okay, now this one is the same thing, probably collected in the same area, but it was a wet day. Do you see how much browner the cap is? I mean, the, yeah, the cap and then the the even uh, the gills not showing up. Oh, it isn't showing up. Not on mine. I'm I'm seeing it. Oh, I don't see it. It's just um. Oh God, I've got some advertisement to update my Zoom. How do I? What do I do about that? <laughs> I don't know how you oh, get rid of it. I don't know. <laughs> Can't they just let let things be? Those of you who can see it, look. It, this is also a darker looking red, but. I'm going to have to come out and come back in. Sorry. It just looks, um, because of the way that it looks, I think, is because it's um, wet. And, and this kind of crackling looking is because it's waterlogged. But here you can see the red flush. And notice, in my case, I always notice that the stem is kind of thin compared to the malacorias. I've got one that looks like this today. From the same place that I got that dermosibe that you know, okay, so I had said might be malacorious, but but apparently it isn't. But I've got one that looks like a fair amount like this today, actually. Same spot. I want, to show, I want to show you one other thing as soon as I figure out how. Oh, we go. oh no, sorry, sorry. Um, we talked about Inonotus obliquus and the pores. Um, if some of you haven't seen the pores, I have that that I can show. First, I want to show you what this thing looked like 10 years ago when I first moved here. This is behind my house about 50 feet. Okay, can you see it yet? Yes. It, that, that's very typical of the shape and size and the white birch and, and this projection sort of thing, which is the sclerotia storage body of some sort. And just this past uh, last fall, I had occasion to pull this off because the tree finally came over. It died. It toppled over most of the upper part of it. And um, then I was able to see the forest down below. Which, let me see if I can get that up. Um, hold on.
Can you see that? Now, I, I, I don't know how you make, uh, let me see if we can zoom into this. Oh, you can. Oh, wow. Yeah, see that, that is the pore surface. There's the little openings. And as far as oh. I it's always this kind of gray, but I was astounded to see this because I've always heard about this, but I've never actually seen it. And a lot of mycologists haven't seen it. Oh, I don't know how you make it. Is, is that on the inner bark or is that on the wood beyond the bark? Do you remember? It's it's under the bark. I, I can actually show you another picture if I can figure out how to make this smaller. This this is sort of a close-up of, of the pores, but let me show you in proportion of where it was from the um, from the fruiting body. I just have to get that picture. I tried to get them all sort of lined up. Now this picture, you have to imagine that that first thing I showed you was right here. And I had just pulled it off and the tree has gone very defunct. But this is what that picture was that I just showed before. Here is the bark coiling back. And the bark's actually pretty thick, but this is the, the poor area of the fungus just below it. And it actually enveloped quite a large area down here. Um, that tree is almost barkless now, this year, but it also has disintegrated and, and decayed even more with an even much larger surface area where the, where the pores were. So anyway, um, I think that's, oh, I just have one more that I wanted to show you. I, I wonder how the spores are dispersed for Inonotus obliquus. I was gonna mention that. I think it's widely believed that it's uh, insects. Oh, you think that could be? Oh, okay. That's, that's, I've heard that over and over again. I think people were even studying that. That's pretty. That could why be. They, why they believed, yeah, insects are underneath. They're eating at the fungus, yeah, and that's 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 probably very likely. But the interesting thing is that they might have evolved that way to to be that in conjunction. I just wanted to show you one other picture here, um, that you talked about, Lycoperidon pyriforme. And here it's it can be quite common. Uh oh. I don't think I did something right. Can you see that? I, I can know. see it. Yep. And I see I see similar scenes. We we have a lot of scenes like that in our woods. Yeah. So so these particular ones here were like, you know, hundreds and hundreds. They were just past their prime for edibility, but about a week before this I had been able to eat it. No, now I'm now I seem to be stuck here. Oh no, I stopped sharing. Okay, everybody seen it? Good. Okay, that's all I needed to show. Great. Thanks, Susan. Great pictures. Yeah, well, I take a lot of pictures all through the summer and I'll be out there the end of March for my first snow melt thing. <laughs> okay. Um Penny, hey, you wanna go? Sure. Sure. Um so, this is from Mushroom Observer. Penny, Penny, you what? What did you say? It's, it's too loud. loud. Is that better? That's about half. Or should I put it lower? Too loud? Your microphone is really loud, but I just turned my volume down on my computer. How about that? Is that better? Too loud? Maricel, why don't you turn the volume down to your computer? I have it down at the bottom. Is it still too loud? Is it still too loud? It's, I think it, it sounds like a, like a connection problem. Because I can't, I can't hear you at all. So Penny, turn, Penny, turn it back up. Turn it back up. Can you hear me now, Penny? Just barely. I think you might be turning your volume down. There's a separate button for your microphone. Oh. 
um, my, I might have a short track. Oh, it's the mute button the up thing. There's a, I don't know, microphone array or somewhere in there. I would just suggest for people to turn the volume down. That's a problem. That's how I did it. I can hear you. Um, so, um, so I found this, um, in my neighborhood two weeks ago, and I guess it's Phallus uh, Ravinelli. That's what I put on my Mushroom Observer. Um, I, when I was reading about it, I saw that, um, Impudicus is not in North America, and Ravinelli had, like, a pink universal veil. So that's what I thought this was. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know how to get back to the. So look, Igor gave you a good, a good vote on that. That's pretty good. What's that? <laughs> I said Igor Safinov gave you a, a good vote on that. That's pretty good. Where, where is that? I don't see it. In your own photograph down at the bottom. Actually, go to scroll down. See that blue bar? Oh. That bar, bar means somebody was uh, giving you like a thumbs up on it. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. When you were in there, I could see it was Igor, who's a member of our club. Yeah. Oh, cool. I didn't realize anyone had uh, responded to it. And then there's one of the eggs. And uh, there it is cut in half. And I was reading about it, and I that some people eat the egg, but... I didn't. <laughs> and there you can see the pink um, universal veil that was, uh, it separates very easily. And this one, when I tried to pick it, it, the universal veil stayed in the ground. And there's there's my collection when I got back home. You keep them inside? What was that? If you keep them inside, because they usually start stinking. I found that out pretty quickly, so then I threw them away. <laughs> the reason they're called stick ones. Exactly. Um, okay. And this is this is my other one, which um, I I came upon. Then they were very old, but this one had had the. Um, Cortina, so I thought it was a Cortinarius, but I'm I'm not that I you know I haven't really uh, identified these that often, but um, I tried to do a spore print, but these the uh, they were so old that nothing came out. But you can see I think a little right here that some spores got trapped under the under the veil there. There they are on the ground. It was uh, you can tell from this I think it was a, a Norway spruce. And there's, there they are on the ground. They look like they grew out and then right up suddenly. Yeah, isn't that funny? Because but that does happen. That's huh? Is there any way to try to figure out what they are? Not at this point, I don't think. Okay. There's a lot of court areas that are kind of brown, and not very distinct, especially when they get to. But the bulbous one is also a thing that sort of looks quite Yeah, they, they, I agree with Susan. It looks like they they um, grew a certain size and then dried up before they matured uh, completely. I'm getting an echo from um, your um, pens, I, I believe. But anyway. Yeah, I need some help with that. I don't know how to get rid of that echo. Some, my last... I think it's because it's your microphone's... Too high, too turned up too much. But anyway, how do I turn the microphone down? I'm not sure, but that's. But I'm pretty sure that's what it is. There's a little arrow by the by the microphone icon. Might be able to go up down with that. I'm not sure. Oh, how's that? Oh, better. 
I did fixed. what you said, and I, I, the microphone was up all the way. So. There you go. You fixed it. That, that's what it was. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anyway, the first photo, um, you know, like Susan said, it's hard to tell to species. Um, a great number of quaternaries are really hard to tell. There's a handful that you can get. But maybe you might want to check Varia Color Group. V A R I, I think it's I E or E I, I E, I forget. C O L O R. It's a group. Um, I think Champignon du Quebec might might have um, you know a bunch of pictures of what they say represents those species in that group. Can you say the name again? I think it's. It's Varia color. I think it's V A R. There you go. I got it. Oops. It's either I E or E I. You have it, Luke? Yeah, I got it. One second. Oh, all right. Someone who's tech savvy enough. Oh, I I. Okay. Yeah, check that one. It's there's a, there's a variety of morphology within this group, but they do kind of look like that. The gills remind me of that. They these like really short gills um, sort of remind me of of that group. So you, you, I'm not saying that's what it is, but it's something to check. Well, that that helps me because my my books had very few. Uh, very few. How do I stop screen share? Oh, I see. Yeah, my books had very few quaternaries in them, and I, I didn't know where to go. But you see, yeah, that. most books only have like one percent of all the quaternary species in North America, if that. Champignon du Quebec has a lot of quaternaries. Is that a website? It's a website. Yeah, um, it's it's in French though, so you have to use like. Google Michael Quebec. Michael Quebec, and then it's the Champagne yeah. Quebec. Yeah, and you know what? If you if you Google, you know what? I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, I think I'll it's Michael it Quebec. Here. Yeah, but but if there's a certain thing, if you Google, Susan, Susan, you get right you get right to the index of species yes. rather than having to navigate um, through a bunch of French stuff. Um, nom, um, so, nom Latin. Yes, Nom's Latin. Latin. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, that's it. And then if you pick you Google the this letter of the alphabet that you want to like court and C for court and areas. Okay, now of course it's going to take me a long time to hit the right letters. I did it already. Oh, oh, that's okay. There it is. There's the noms Latin. Oh. Latin. Yeah, you need that. You need that. That'll take you to the species index. Otherwise, you're going to be searching around for it, and it's hard to find it unless you know how to speak French. And but can I Google that, and you'll go right to it. And I'll I'll add the, these guys have a really good phone app. It's like ten dollars to download, but everything that's in the Noms Latin Champion de Quebec, you can download and have on your phone, so you really? can take you can take it with you. Really? Oh, yep. I didn't know that. And you can switch back and forth between French and Latin. I actually find it easier to use the Latin because I can kind of work that out. Nina has it in her iPad or phone, whatever mm -hmm. iPad, and we use it in the field. Yeah, it's really yeah. nice. Uh -huh. And if you if you use it on Google, you can get Google to translate the French. Sort of. More or less. Yeah, mm -hmm. kind of. You find out that <laughs> you know, Hat Red has Mr. Bullied. You know. <laughs> You, you sort of get stuff like that if you're lucky. But for like spore measurements and stuff like that, that's numbers, like sizes of, of fruit bodies and so forth, that's just numbers. You know, you just have to look at the numbers. So, so it's, it's easy to get a good deal of information. Plus, they have a lot of really good pictures. Yes, they do. And a lot of obscure species. So, all right, cool. Well, thanks, Penny. Thank you for sharing. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. I have three people, myself included. So Maricel, then Dave, and then myself. Um, okay.
You guys see my screen? Yeah, I see a list of names. It looks okay. like an email. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm logging out of my daughter's email. <laughs> I'm logging back into mine. Oh. <laughs> I love to use my computer for uh, school. She's in a, well, everyone here is in virtual school right now. <laughs> okay. Now we see Maricel stuff, right? Yeah. Okay, there you go, Maricel. All right. On Saturday, I went to Amico Island. It's a place where uh, a creek called Rancocas ends in the Delaware River. And it's kind of diagonal to Philadelphia. And I, there are um, a lot of mature trees. Uh, there are no conifers in the island, maybe three little fir trees, that's it. And so I found a lot of stuff on huge trees that are very rotten and because it rained a lot a few days before, so the wood was so wet. And I found these little cushion like um, fruiting bodies. There were plenty of them and the photos pretty bad. But when I came home and I look at them, let's see if we can see anything. Oh, I can. I'm not. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's pretty bad. But it, when you look at close, each little pillow-like structure is made out of balls. Like, mm, like, oh gosh, I can't say. Yeah, made out of balls. It's pretty bad. The photo was, I couldn't do better than that. But then I had no clue what it was. When I did the micro, it was so cool. It has this, can you show the other um, photo? Each ball, uh, you see in the photo in the left side, the balls are those uh, circular structures. Mm -hmm. Those are the balls. And uh, they reproduce, I don't exactly know, but you can see that where the arrow is, there are two joined, like a chain. Those are new cells. What, or, what's the what's the level of magnification here, Marisol? Uh, the one before oil. Oh. Oh no 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 no! no I'm so sorry. The one, uh, the, the the third one, is 140 20. This is 20, but I got 40. Okay, this is 20, so you could see like different structures there, and you can see that some of the the spores are dividing. There is like um, a segment connecting them in the lower center. Look, can you show that? Yeah. No. Yeah, a little lower towards the left. Yeah, right there, right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I don't. I still don't understand exactly how this works. If the circles are already mature structures or what's going to happen and the information online is in italian so i could now understand and i didn't realize that i could translate that but i could now understand um, I, have, I have a couple questions go ahead so, first of all this is fungus right it is it is it's an asco my seat okay an asco okay now i was yeah. gonna ask are these canidio spores see si. yeah 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 okay. I see. Okay. Uh -huh. So these are individual spores that are just connected, like in chains. Yeah. Uh, that's probably how it divides. It must be like an asexual um, ascomy, the asexual yeah. stage of an ascomycete. Gotcha. Yeah. And uh, can you show the other photo? Uh huh. So each of those structures is one of the balls making up the big pillow shapes. They were yellow and transparent. So this is like uh, 20. And the, the, the balls, the spheres are really huge. It was really cool. Ah, and somebody got very excited when I posted in Facebook and I'm going to send the specimen to a uh, professor in Florida because she studies those. So it was kind of excited and there are several species. Mm. Mm -hmm. So how did you actually identify that? I thought, um, oh, in a, in a book that I have at home, I remember that I have seen something close. Uh, 
So then I went to the book, look at the name and wrote the name in Facebook, in iNaturalist. And then in Jonathan, one James, one person that is going to give us a speech. Oh, great. James Mitchell. Yes, yes. He corrected the name. I he knew see. what it was. Mm -hmm. He's pretty smart. He knows these ASCOs really well. Yeah, he knows super little tiny things. Yeah, yeah weird things. Mm -hmm. huh, very cool. That was so cool, yep. And I actually found it a year ago and I could not make any sense out of it until this weekend. You can see some kind of Haifa connecting them. The spheres plus that smaller type of Haifa, Haifa, whatever that is. Hmm. Very neat. Mm -hmm. I'll go look at the original one again. This is so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it gives us an idea of what we're looking at. See, it's, it's made out of spheres, yellow spheres. Yep. That's neat. All right. I'll go back up there so everyone can see the name again. There's the name. Oh, and I was like like laughing about the name because it couldn't be more perfect. Spheros, porium lignatile, like spheres eating wood. <laughs> Something yeah. like that. Yeah. All right. Any more questions on this one? You, how, to me, I would think the first thing I would think is that a slime mold. How, how can you tell the difference? When I look with the lens, uh, I saw, I actually thought at the beginning that it was a slime mold because it was made out of, it could be an immature slime mold because it was made out of these jelly like spheres. But then when I look at it at home, it didn't look like a slime mold. All right, great. Mm -hmm. The fine mushrooms that I am showing to you today, I found in all of them in Namiko Island. So um, this one is a, is a crust. It was so hard to get it out of the tree. The tree is suspended and it fell on other trees, so it's a little high up um, from the ground, like, uh, like say like, five feet and then I got a few pieces but I couldn't tell what it was so it looks like white paint the color it looks like pinkish but it's really white and it's smooth and it has few words you can see on the picture you can show the other pictures please and it has an like a raised edge you can see that too you can see the words uh, can you show the other picture? And when when I took it, when I finally got to look at the microscope, I wet it. I all I always wet half of it to see how it changes, and I can have dry the other half um, side dry, so I can compare. So when I did the micro, it happens to be an heterobasidiomycete. Hetero means that the basidia is divided. And it, the stigmata is really, really long. And in this case, this one had four stigmata in the left or two, the one in the right. And I did three drawings of the stigmata, but the, they do, are not at scale. So one, the one in the middle is a little smaller and the three together, is they are smaller, but they are all the heterobastidium my seat. I just wanted to show how they were together. And the, the spores were humongous and beautiful, full of like little droplets inside. And um, oh, yeah, I said that. Oh, and one cool thing, when I wet the half side of it and I touch it, the white color disappear. And it revealed like an ochre tone. That was the rest of the flesh. The, yeah, the rest of the cross had that uh, cream color. Those are the spores. They look like kind of beans, giant kidney beans. Mm. They had that special curve. And um, an apiculus, which is the, the tip of the, where they were attached to the stigmata. Nice. Mm -hmm. 
Cool. How big were these? Like, like from there? Um, not too big, like say two inches, three inches. Okay. One inch on the top and two inches below, but there were several floating bodies. That was so cool. I never found it before. All right. Everybody got the name? Very cool. Any more questions on this one? Oh, and this belongs to the tremelales, to the jelly fungi like mm, tremela mesenterica because they got that kind of uh, heterobasidio mycete and and that climises they belong to that family interesting mm -hmm. okay next i found another cool crust and this one was very worthy and bumpy and it was on a rotten deciduous piece of wood that was really wet at the edge of a pond. Can you show the other photos, please? There are better, uh, yeah, you can see those words. There are words on the words. Hmm. And I have seen it before and I ran to the box and I, and then when I did the micro, I remember. So can you show the micro? Oh, those are the spores, sorry for the, horrible microphoto. All the spore print was pinkish. It was a pale version of the color of the crust. You can see where the arrow is. Oh, no, no, it's my own arrow, I'm sorry. And the right, yeah. And the, the spores are, were almost uh, sub, oh, what's the name? Sub, I can't say that. Subglobose. No, Subglobose, thank you, thank you. And the, um, the apiculus seems like in the wrong place. It's a little weird, the position. Lateral. Oh, thank you. Oh, okay. And it was funny because when I was doing the micro, I could observe the spores turning around and that little apiculus going in that place, turning around and hiding and then showing again in that particular spot. So it's lateral, thank you. And the name of this crust used to be megalocystid. No, no, no. Megalo. Oh, geez. What name do I have there? Megalocystidielum. Yeah. Because this structure that I draw, three of them, is gigantic. It's really, really long and it's in the context, in the flesh. So it characterizes this type of crusts. But now they call them gloeocystidielum. It used to be called megalocystidielum, now it's gloeocystidielum. But it refers to the same thing, that microscopic structure is called gloeocystidia. And the basidia was really long, four spores. You can see the basidia with the four Sterigmata. Mm -hmm. So these are the gloeocystidia. Yes. Mm -hmm. Gloeocystidia and then the basidia. Basidium. Uh -huh. And where were these crystals at? It is spread in in the everywhere. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the flesh, when you crush it, then they are all over the place. And those are the spores, and and I put. Somebody was trying to help me and she asked me if they were amyloid and then I put the um, melsers and immediately they turned dark. So they were amyloid. Means they changed color with melsers. Very amyloid. <laughs> Super, yeah, it was, they became really dark. All right, but you didn't. You don't know the species, huh? No, it's too tricky. I can't. <laughs> yeah, but at least I can get to the genus. Yeah, <laughs> it's good enough. For yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. I found another glow. It's istidielum. Different color. So this one also looked like white paint, and I thought it was the same. Exceed the. Ex the first one that I showed you that it was uh, like Exidio white paint. Exidiopus or oh. Exidiopus. 
XCD. Oh, I can't remember. And but when I did the micro, I got a surprise. It has the Gloeocystidia again, but it's a different. There are probably several species of them, and this one doesn't have warts like the pink, orange. Um, the fruiting so bodies were a little you, bigger. How did you do the micro? Did you take part of it? And yeah, a tiny it? little piece. Yeah, I take a little tiny piece. And then I um, put it on the... Oh, oh, when I get home, I haven't... I didn't do this before, but now I is, I'm doing it in a different way. I put my crusts in paper envelopes upside down. So so they don't drop the spores. So when I come home, I put, I slice a slide and I put them in the right way so they will drop the spores. So now I can see many spores at once. And then when I have the spore print, I take a photo of the spore print and then I take a tiny little piece of the flesh of the crust and I smash it down and, and see it. And because the, my microscope is so dirty, I cannot show you good quality photos. So I do drawings to show you. So right here on the right side, you can see the gloeocystidia. It's the same structure. It's like a, like a long body, sinuous kind of long body full of matter. Um, you can see the, oh, the shape of the spores. There was a big space between the drop of matter that was inside the spore. And some spores have a huge uh, apiculus. I don't know why, but I saw many of them, I noticed. Sometimes they have two drops. In, yeah, so. Oh, and this one had a horrible smell like dirty feet. It was really bad. What is this stuff here? Is it like embedded into the? It's really attached to the wood. It was really hard to get it out. Yep. I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really in. Mm -hmm. hmm. All right. So there's the name again for everyone. Anybody else have any questions on this? I have one question on on the previous one. Um, it almost looked like there was another uh, fungus with one of those um, like war zone uh, um, 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 battle walls. <laughs> what what thing? That thing that, that uh, separates, not that. The spalting? <sighs> on, this, on this particular one? The first one with the little yellow balls had Ascocorni uh, alongside Oh, yeah, Ascocorni silicium. Yeah. There were a million things happening there together. <laughs> hmm. Are we talking about? No, about the first, the yellow. First one. Yeah, the top yellow. one. Pillows, the asco my seat. Yeah, it had a little purple um, asco. There, there, the there. That there. picture. Yes. Oh, oh, oh right here. Oh, this one. Oh. This is what... that, that dark line. I posted something um, that Bill Yule and I had a little discussion. Um, and uh, um, Lynn Body talks about that. The um, So it, is this another? fungus up at the top or is that just the edge it's the somehow edge. it's the edge and there is just bark like okay. the bark is gone and i didn't notice that only now in the photo yeah no yeah so it's got a dark edge mm, apparently or i know what you're saying Kay. there could be another fungus in the wood there could be like um oh, i feel the wood and that's the spalting where they, you know, where they throw up the, the chemicals. To oh, is that what spalting is? Okay. Yeah. Setting um, up limits. Yeah, that's a good way yeah. of saying it. Yeah. Them, yeah, they can be very pretty. Spell that yeah. word? Spalting. S-P-A-U-L-T-I-N-G. Spalting. All right. So that answers your question, right, Kay? Yes, thank you. 
Mm -hmm. And then I know what you were saying, um, Dave, in this one. Yeah, the lower, the lower left there. That yeah. what is that? Ascocorini. Ascocorini silicium. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're picking apart everything in these this week. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and in the same island, Amico Island, I found this polypore on a willow that was at the edge of the lake. There are ponds and lakes and the river, and I. It, when I saw it, it looked like Ishnoderma, but I don't really, I never examined Ishnoderma before, so I have no idea. And I still don't know what it is. Um, can you please, yeah. Looks like a mature Ishnoderma. It does? Oh. Yeah, when they're young, they look different. When they're, when they're mature, they flatten out oh. and get thinner, and, and, and mm -hmm. um, the, the flesh is not quite as, as That's rubbery. That's That's not Ishnoderma resinosum. It's, you don't think so? No, they the pores are so fine you cannot even see them. It's almost like uh, what used to be Piptoporus betulinus. The the oh, pores, no, no, no. the hand lens to even see the pores on it. No, these one has even four. When they get oh. even when they're old like this? Uh, no, I don't think so. No, this is not Piptoporus betulinus. No, no, no. I was just comparing it for what? the look of the pores. Oh, oh, oh. You the can't pores, use it without, the, without a hand lens. Um, the pores were like four per uh, millimeter, and, and look at the, the, the spores. They were so thin, like two, 5.1. It were 5.1 5 and a little bit less than one. Uh, uh, 5.1 and 2.5, the width. Um, like polypore, no, that's not the one. Blue ball, that is blur, blast, okay. I can't find the papers. What are the, the dimensions on the spores? Because I have... I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to find... Yeah, I have these. Ischnoderma resinosum here. Yeah, they look like the Ischnoderma spores. Yeah, they look like that. Can yeah. you lower... I got my measurements there. Oh, yeah, that matches right up with Ischnoderma. Oh, okay. Pretty close. Well, pretty close. I'm sorry. Yeah, some Not people suggested, yeah, but I wasn't sure, so maybe. And they say that they change. Oh, and another thing that I noticed, but it's pretty bad. You can really see it in the photos of the pores. Some of the pores are like teeth. And they say something about that in Ishnoderma. I'm looking you know? at Ishnoderma too right now in, um, you know, the Rivarden book. It's mm -hmm. just four to six pores per millimeter mm -hmm. and his four sizes are five to seven by one and a half to two just oh, okay. pretty close pretty close to what you have there oh okay okay oh cool yep was it old and dried up no it was fresh it was the color was right like that beautiful tone but but, but was it did it give when you touched it i mean is it Soft is it? Oh, oh, it was a spongy. Yeah, okay. Did you try KOH on it? On the I cap? did, yeah, and it turned black instantly. Black, immediately black on the yes. cap. Well, yes. a lot of polypores do that, but Ishnoderma does that. It, and it absorbed, but it's so spongy that it went like immediately went in. Yeah, how about the flesh? Did you put KOH on the flesh or the tube? Oh, no, no, I didn't. Yeah, it's a little different on the tubes. It's it's not as dark. Oh, and the flesh was kind of creamy color, like the pork color. Yeah, and it gets to be like tan when they okay. when they're mature or okay. almost mature. I'm not really sure what mature means for one of those, to be honest. <laughs> okay. Um, but but when the, but they do dry out, and and I think the pores get a little bigger when they when they dry out from mm -hmm. when they're very young. Right, you can you can hardly see the pores. Okay, this yeah. one was like five centimeters i wrote the dimensions there what five centimeters think? that's pretty small for for ishnoderma resinous and actually and also being but, itself but who knows because it was on a willow that wasn't too big you know what i mean Maybe oh, okay. not, enough, not enough subtraction to grow too big i don't know yeah right. eight, eight centimeters huh hmm. yeah eight centimeters mm. yeah it's pretty small Thank you. I don't know. Those spores look pretty good, though. 
Mm -hmm. Do we take a session of Dharma? Well, I'm less confident than I am when I first said that's what I thought it was. So I, I don't know. Um, did you did you get a see, did you see the cross section of the flesh and tubes? Yeah. Uh -huh. it's yeah you don't have to have a picture of that. Oh no, I didn't post a picture. I can do that. Yeah. Hmm. No, I, I not right now. Yeah. All right. Well, you know what? Maybe next time I'm at Ricketts, I'll. I'm sure there'll be some old Ishno Dharma there. That's that grows like a weed there, and maybe I'll try to find a few older ones. Okay. And just just to compare. Mm -hmm. I think it's a pretty good call, though. I mean, it's... the color seemed like, and the spongy consistency, very light when you touch it. It's, it's spongy, and when you hold it, it's very light. Hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Well, thanks, Marisol. Good. Okay. Oh man. Which I keep having. All right, Dave. Good to you. Okay. And then then I'll go after that. Then I saw Hervé. And then just a reminder, if anybody else has anything, to get your name into that chat. All right. OK. This, this was really interesting. There are two species of Neolecta that are documented in North America. One is irregularis and the other is vitellina. These look like vitellina. They're club shaped, pretty much, or cylindrical, let's say. They're not sort of all over the place. Ir irregularis is, as the name would imply. They, they kind of spread out and they just make these kind of formless globs. Um, and the spores matched Vitalina, although it's not much different than irregularis, the sizes are almost the same. I found a bunch of small globose, subglobose conidia, which is, a, a, this is an ASCO, which is associated with um, vitalina. There's pictures of, of this stuff. The pictures of the conidia are not great because they're really small, so it's hard to get the camera to focus on them through the microscope. Um, but the thing is, the two different species, irregularis and vitellina, um, vitellina, the, the ascii are supposed to be between 50 and 75 microns, and irregularis, um, the ascii are supposed to be between 120 and 135 microns long, the ascii, that is. And I found this same species last year in the exact same spot in a two, three needle pine forest. Um, and I think that's the spores. That's not particularly interesting, but, but at least it's a decent picture of the spores so I can get decent measurements. But anyway, the ASCII that I, that I found, and there's one picture of, of a few of them. See, I did a smash mount, so they kind of dislodge and float around in the, I use <laughs> Congo red. And these ASCII measure, these are about 95 microns long. And then I found another one that was about 125 microns long. That puts these ASCII squarely in between the two ranges for the two documented species. So this one here is about 125 microns long, this ASCUS. Um, now, I'm not sure if I'm measuring these the wrong way. I mean, maybe you don't measure the whole thing, but I think you do because I found pictures online on ASCO France of um, ASCII from um, Neolecta, and that they're showing the whole thing all the way down to this like tapered sort of tail uh, in the upper left. So there's a third species, um, Neolecta Flavo, blah, 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 Flavo something or other. Uh, it's not even documented in, in North America. 
So I think this is very interesting. I, I preserved a few of these little guys. Um, you know who studies these? Who's, who studies them? Um, David Hewitt at Drexel. Oh. He, I think he lives in D.C. now, but he still is like a professor at Drexel. He gave, oh. us, a, he gave us a talk a couple of years ago on Schweinitz, Schweinitz. But he did like his, um, I think he did his Ph.D. on these. Well, you know art. what? Maybe I'll try to get in touch with him. I have his uh, information. To me, this seems very interesting. So this is at Drexel. Uh, oh, he's at someplace else now. What's, it, what's the name? Uh, Hewitt, H-E-W-I-T-T? -T? Yeah, that's it. David? David, yeah. I'm pretty good friends with him. I'll... I'll send this to oh him. oh yeah 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 send him the, the just send him a link to the observation um to me it seems very interesting um there aren't many species documented i think there's i've only found three species names documented globally two of them in north america and the the size of the ascii don't fit either of the north american species um so so i'm just wondering you know if i have something notable here um, same thing last year i picked some last year did the micro and got the exact same types of measurements so i have another observation on mushroom observer from last year where i got where i show, showed the same sort of measurements on the micro so so that was pretty cool i mean that's pretty cool that, yeah do we, ever yeah. Do, we ever, do we ever find these in the pine barrens anybody ever see these down there because i've always wondered if they grew there but because the pine barrens would be good habitat for them. That's what I was thinking. That, you know, that's the kind of thing you might find in the pine barrens. But I don't know. Pine barrens to me seems like another planet. You know, <laughs> I go there and like everything I see is something that I don't see here. <laughs> and, uh, when I lived in New Jersey, I was familiar with the species, but it might have been because I traveled a lot. I, I, or at least the Neolecta. Up here in the Adirondacks, I find what I call irregularis every year in the exact same place, and usually quite a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, sometimes there's a lot of them in the, in this one little area. It's not a very big area, just a few square yards, but some years uh, there might be you know 20 or 30 of them there. This year there was there was only like six of them, so I took three of them um, home with me, or four You're of them actually. The same area. Home. All right, cool. Okay. Oh, my Cena, you know, so everybody can basically say they don't know what the species is. So, you know, but actually, there's a few traits here that sort of stand out. Um, there's a lot of like, little hairs on the base. If, if you zoom on this, this picture, you can probably see them. Yeah, that's in situ picture. You, you don't get a real good. Yeah, there we go. See these, see these hairs all over the base. Um, so that's one thing that, um, that sort of, well, there's, there's more than a few Mycena that have this sort of trait. Uh, the spores were pretty big. I think they were all the way up to about 13 microns. Or I forget what I wrote down here. Um, amylite spores, you know, which you would expect from Mycena. There were a lot of them, though. The, there were like a few hundred of them in, you know, maybe maybe 12 square yards, eight or 10 square yards. Yes. All my cenas okay. have amyloid spores. I didn't know that. Yeah, most of them do. So most? some of them have weakly amyloid spores. Oh. Some my cenas have spores um, that are questionably amyloid, but a lot of my cenas have pretty, pretty markedly amyloid spores. If, if you get a good thick print, you know, mm -hmm. it'll turn the melters really dark okay. uh, immediately. Mm-hmm. Are there springtails in there? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know much about bugs, but I didn't even know what they were until I blew the picture up. I thought it was dirt, actually. I blew the picture up on my computer and saw those little guys. So. Can I say something about them? Sure. They have six legs, but they are not insects. Oh. 
Yeah, I think I think they're springtails. See, they belong to a different family because they have something special in the rear end. Something is different. Oh, uh, okay. Insects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, they're called hexapods. <laughs> Six legs. Hexapods, oh. and there are 8,000 species of them. Oh, well, that narrows it down. <laughs> 8,000. And some of them are white, some of them are blind, purple, uh -huh. pink. Beautiful. They're nice. Beautiful. Yeah, the picture came out pretty good, I thought. Well, that's one reason why I, I put this one up for discussion was the pictures weren't bad. I don't really expect anybody to know what this is. Maybe I'll go through. What's that? Did it have a smell? Not much. I, I squished some in between my fingers when it was still pretty fresh. And, you know, maybe, maybe a, a very, very slightly bleachy odor, but it was very fleeting. It wasn't like the ones that are really bleachy. Oh, Dave, mm -hmm. one more question. Because now I am finding a lot, I mean, less now, but I have been interested in my sinus, and the smell is described as a bleach smell. Because it's of so them, yeah. bad. Ooh, it's so strong. So bleach. I didn't yeah, know some that. of them. Did. This one, very, very faint. Not much. I would say um, not a notable odor, mm. honestly. Um, but, you know, the pictures weren't bad. The spore picture came up pretty good, I think. Um, is, is that in, Carousel, is it? did you say that the insects were hexapods? Mm -hmm. Yes. That, I just looked it up, and that's like a a large subphylum. Mm -hmm. It's not a specific. Insect. Yeah, there are different genus. Yeah. Looks like those spores are up to. Oh God, I'm sorry. Six legs. I might be able to figure this one out from Rene LeBouf's key. If I just don't have enough time all the time. But these spores are pretty distinctive. The, the, the Q on these spores is really big. In other words, the ratio of length to width looks like it's well exceeds two, maybe even close to three in some of them. I think that might be fairly unusual in genus Mycena to get a Q, average Q, sort of that big. So I might be, might be able to figure this one out. I'll be, I have one more week of work and then I have time off for a while. Maybe I'll revisit some of this stuff. Can you explain a little bit more about that Q? I just can't get it. Yes, if you, if you measure the length mm -hmm. and you measure the width yeah. and you make a ratio of the length on top of the ratio and the width on the bottom, yeah. that number reduces, you can, you can turn it to a decimal. Do and I then that's Q. Yeah, you can just do do the division and make it into a decimal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what? Yeah, and and that's Q. That's yeah, Q I know is. what you're saying. How to do that? Yes, but what does it matter? Oh, Q is 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 a um, off times is very telling um, because it'll it's a way of just discussing how long as opposed to wide the spores are. So it tells you something about the shape. Oh. Okay, so a smaller Q is going to be, you know, they won't be as, the length is not going to be so much bigger than the width. These particular spores, the length is quite a bit bigger than the width. Oh, it looks like, okay. it looks like approaching, you know, okay. three, which mm -hmm. I, I have to review Mycena, but I think that's probably on the big side for, for Mycena. So that might be a useful piece of information. I'm just sort of hoping, you know, mm -hmm. that'll help me narrow it down. And they were in grass, actually, near pines and oaks. In a great, so you can see where they're growing here in the in-situ and in, mm -hmm. in this grassy area. They seem to be very small, yeah? How, how, yeah, they, they're very small. I might have a picture here with them in my hand. I think the one hey, picture. Hey, Dave, yeah. how, about, how about the name Mycena murata? Do you know that one? Um, no, I, I haven't really looked, but you know what? I'll look that up later. Because uh, I, just, I just put it through Rene LaBeouf's keys. Oh. And that's what I got, and I Googled it, and it looked pretty similar, and the spores are in that range. Mir what is it, Mirata? Yeah, M-I-R-A-T-A, -A. and it's a peck species, so oh. it puts it right okay. in your neighborhood. Yeah, so it's, okay, I'll look that up. Thanks, Luke. I'll check that out. Sounds like a good possibility. Good old, All right, well, thank you. Good old Renee's keys. <laughs> <laughs>
yeah. Um, okay, well, that's enough with the Mycenas. I got a few other things here. So there's one thing, I don't know if it's the next one. There's one thing that I have no idea what it is. It's, it's kind of old. Let's see what comes up here. Yeah, this thing. I have no idea what this thing is. The spores were pretty strongly amyloid. I got a nice spore, white spore drop, put, the, put a drop of melters on, it went black pretty much immediately. Um, the, the gills appear to be free, like very free, but it's actually a little hard to tell. This is an old sort of fruit body that's kind of withered. And perhaps the gills are actually just um, seceding, you know, tearing away from the, the stipe. But if you do a close up now, if you zoom in on this one right here, and you know what I should have done here? I really should have looked at a gill edge under the microscope to see if this if this crenulate stuff on the on the edges is is cystidia because if it is that would eliminate genus amanita and i don't think this is an amanita but i can't think of what else it it, it would qualify as being um, when you see the spores they really look like like amanita spores like something from section validae so I don't think it's an amanita, but I can't think of anything more, you know, to, I mean, maybe it's a, it's a, it's a lavandola, you know, slash citrina. Um, it's just really old and doesn't look like it's supposed to in the stipe base, you know, rotted in the ground or something like that. It, I mean, that's the best I can come up with. Those look like amanita spores. Um, and you can see that's just, that's mounted just in melters, I believe. So you can see they got pretty dark. Um, so anyway, if anybody has an idea, if you come up with something, go on Mushroom Observer or send me an email if you're not a member. You have to be a member to make a proposal. Um, globose, subglobose uh, spores. I think I think they're up to about. I I, I think I pro I'm not sure I put measurements there, but it looks like they're up to about maybe eight microns long diameter, maybe nine on, on a few of them. Um, so anyway, I thought that was interesting, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> so. so I just called it a Garicales and I've got no bite so far. Sometimes, sometimes you do better on Mushroom Observer if you, if you say you think if you just post something that could be, even if, though you know it's wrong, then people come on because they, you know, they can't wait to tell you you're wrong. Um, so, that, that just happened, that happened to me um, today, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> just today that happened. <laughs> but uh, um, anyway, maybe I'll do that. I don't know. I'll, I'll think about it. <laughs> There you go. Okay, Susan, here you go. I'm not sure about this one. Uh, the spores measure a little bit small for semi-sanguineous. Um, and it's wet. It's wet, so which would account for um, the darker color. It might be the same species as that other thing, though, that other dermocybe. Uh, but when you see the gills... Um, you mean the thing you had last week? Yes. Yeah, but these these gills are a lot more like semi sanguineous. Yeah, that, that looks very red. Yeah, Stems so look right, but still. Yeah, the um, the, this is close red. by where those other things were, and you know what, the spore size is not that much different, so it could be that same species. Mm -hmm. Um, and the spores, as far as I can tell, using my better microscope, not this one. This is the one I get good pictures through. Uh, but looking through the other one, I could not see any warts on on the surface. Um, maybe they maybe a little wrinkled, you know, what they sometimes just call varicose. But if if so, it was very very slight. Um, so uh, yeah, I thought that was a that was like the maybe the last mycorrhizal gilled mushroom I'm gonna find this year. 
Uh, if you look at that first picture again, you'll notice um, the very first picture, the in situ picture. See these little grains? Those are that's ice. Yeah. Oh, that it snowed. It snowed oh. last week, and there was still some snow lying around in this spot. And it had some of it had melted, and then sort of the remains coalesced into these little icy crystals. <laughs> so I don't I don't know if I'm going to find any more mycorrhizal. Um, uh, mushrooms this year. We'll see. Supposed to warm up over the weekend. When I found uh, Cortinarius semi sanguineus after it's frozen, it does actually change color a little bit overall. It also. Uh -huh. So, you know what? This one probably froze. It was not yeah. really old, but it was old enough yeah, to have been up for a little while. Yeah, but it certainly interrupts its growth. It also changes the way it dies. It's much weaker. Oh. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Changes the chemistry somehow. Mm -hmm. I guess we got one more here. I forget what it is. Oh, I sent you. I sent you another thing, Luke. Oh yeah, I got it. I like it. time. Oh, yeah. uh, a hebeloma. You know, I dried it out. I'll ask Henry uh, <laughs> Becker if he wants it. Um, it's they were a little bit old. There were two of them, but the one here that's upright position was in pretty good shape, so I dried it out. And I got a nice picture of the. Kyla cystidium, which which matches very well with the mesophame, was it mesophamia, mesophamium, whatever whatever it is, a group. So there's a picture of a couple of pictures of the uh, Kyla cystidium, um, which which account for the the textured gill edges on some of the Hebaloma species. That's the spores right there. Um, yeah, and that's typical sort of Hebaloma shaped spores. Uh, maybe almond shaped, a little sometimes humpbacked, but these were hard to see. They didn't really want to show up real well, um, but I did manage to get a couple of pictures because they're kind of like highline, I guess. They don't, they don't really, and they didn't really pick up the Congo red very well. But cylindrical, these are the cylindrical Chylocystidia, and there's a lot of them. There's a lot they, of them on the gill edge. They. Mm -hmm. Yes. So all hevelomas have the type of uh, cystidia or only? I, I'm not sure. Oh. I, you know, I think I, re I remember scoping some other hebelomas and, and they had more, they had like hymenial cystidia that were more bottle shaped. Oh. I, I think, you know what, I'd have to, to, look, to look through my, my own records and read, read up a little bit more again. Mm -hmm. um, but but at any rate, this this species group is supposed to have these kind of um, chylocystidia, so at least that matches, and the, and the habitat matches. It's a it's a conifer associate pine. I think pine is listed as one of the primary. That's actually through my other scope, my binocular, and I never get decent photos through my. Well, I shouldn't say never because this one's not too bad. Um, <laughs> Through the, through the binoc through one of one of the eyepieces on the binocular scope, so it actually looked a lot better than that looking you know with both eyes, um, but it's the, basically the same deal there the chylocystidia. Mm -hmm. so, chylocystidia are on the edge of the gill, is that? Yeah, it? they're on the edge of the gill. Mm -hmm. As opposed to the face of the gill, which is yeah, those are the pleurocystidia. Yeah, okay. On the face of the gill. And um, a lot of times you'll know ahead of time that you're looking for chylocystidia because the gill edge, you'll look at it and you can see it's what, what they will call fimbriate or cren, I think it's crenate or crenulate, crenate, I think. Where you can actually see a little grainy sort of texture on the gill edge. And, um, and that, that, you know, you're going to find a whole lot of chylocystidia then. You, know, you sort of know ahead of time. Uh, that's why I should have scoped that thing that I thought might be an amanita, because if I found a bunch of chylocystidia, I would have known that it was not an amanita. So, and that and that was old and it was rotting, so I didn't keep it around for very long. But anyway, that's yeah, mesophaeum, I guess is how you say that one. And this have an odor? Yeah, it was a little bit radishy. You know, I should have put that in here. I forgot to list that in here. Yeah, it's, it it had the radish odor that a lot of hebelomas have. Maybe not as strong as some of the other ones, but oh, there's some hebelomas though smell like saccharin. <laughs> hmm. um, it's a different section or subgenus of hebelomas. Like what they? Saccharin, like oh, like saccharin. sugary, okay, sugary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So 
Um, and then I thought I was hoping maybe Dorothy would be here because she would enjoy this. This was this was these pictures were taken by one of our club members down here, um, and I made um, a Mushroom Observer post out of it. And I don't know if Jason Hollinger has seen it yet because he'll come on and he will let us know if he agrees. And if he does not agree, he'll make a counter proposal um, because he's very very good about his. Um, sharing of information. What is uh, the lichen? It's a lichen, yeah. What is yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, oh, well, it's, it's coming, I guess. Yeah, yeah. it's loading. loading. Yeah, the pictures were really nice. This guy got some really nice pictures uh, that, that show good close-up detail on some of the, and, and Karen's not here right now. She's upstairs. I guess she's got something else to do because she could tell you more about what, what these structures are. Because I, I honestly don't know as much about lichen. So. My mushroom observer doesn't want to load now. Um, well, to go let somebody else go. You know, if, if there's a few minutes uh, later, we can. Okay. Well, I was going to go, but everything in mind's on mushroom observers, too. <laughs> oh, huh. Okay, I won't stop sharing. Give Mushroom Observer a minute to get itself together. Yeah, sometimes sometimes it gets into sort of a crash mood. Yeah, I know Hervé. Hervé said he had some stuff to do show. So you want to you want to give it a shot, Hervé? You are still muted, I think, Hervé. OK. There you go. OK, I have something here. I I assume this is, but I'm not sure. So I need your help. It's kind of neat, you know, uh, they are like interesting effect with the, with the rain. OK, let's go to the next one. Uh, um. The cat. Okay, I have to get rid of the cat. Okay. Another view of the same thing here. Another view here. So could it be ceramic parchment at an early stage when it's not thick and 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 cracking? You mean you mean xylobolus frustratula? I think that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's that. No. Uh, maybe I. You know what? I did have a discussion about that species once with somebody on Mushroom Observer. And actually, I do remember now that that I did learn something about it, and I think it was similar to what you had just suggested that some that it starts out as more of a, a bigger sort of sheets and it cracks apart when it gets old. So maybe, um, maybe I don't know. What would? I cannot tell. You know, this is like a rotted wood. Because Silobolus frustulatus only grows on oak. Uh, and it's, I can't tell you. It's, it's very it's likely to be oak because this is, uh, this in the Rutgers Gardens, you know, in the higher woods, this is like it was an oak forest, you know, all the oaks are dying. Oh, okay. I see an oak leaf right we underneath the log. Plenty, uh, yes, most I of the dead wood there is, is oak. Sometimes if you poke your knife on the wood, boy, it's so hard. The yeah. Mm -hmm. but, it uh, kind of I didn't looks check. like it. It's just a little blurry, but kind of. It was very nice looking, you know. It has very this interesting. This one looks uh, more visual. like it. This one, it looks more like it. Yep. Yes. Okay. So. 
Do you think it could be a silo bolus? It could be, yep. Some, you no, know, in this genus. Okay, I have another one. Uh, oh, the cat in front of me all the time. Okay, please. Okay, here. Okay, they're like uh, miniature puff balls that are black. The big one, are the size of a seed of a pepper, you know, and the surface is bumpy. Is Let's it on beach? I think it's on beach. Oh, the hypoxylon? Yep. Coherence, is that? Uh, fragilis, but it doesn't look like fragilis. Oh, it yeah. could be another, yeah, I don't Coher know. Because fragilis is like rounded. Yeah, but this you don't think it's cramp balls? Mm -hmm. No, that's daldinia, I think, isn't it? No, no, that that carbon yeah. balls is daldinia. Yeah, that these are, I don't think these are daldinia. No, that's not daldinia. It's this hypoxylon. Is to tell daldinia, you have to section it and look on the inside. Okay. And then you will see shiny, concentric rings. But this is not Daldinia. No, Daldinia wouldn't grow so many parts like this. It's bigger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think you're in the right ballpark here, Hervé, because you have an um, annual hypoxylon name up there. And it's something in there, hypoxylon. Mm -hmm. See the name you, have you have up here in in Yulo hypoxylon thaurcianum. Oh, oh, cramp heard. balls. Oh, I'm sorry. Cramp balls. I thought you said carbon balls. Um, yeah, you know what? I think this Anulo hypoxylon is a recent split off of genus hypoxylon. Because I believe I, I had a discussion about with about this on Mushroom Observer maybe a year or so ago. Um, well, it sure. has a ring. It has a ring around the uh, whatever the hole is called. But I don't. You can't quite. You can almost see some of the, the one right in the middle. There might be like a ring, almost like a nipple, you know, around, and that's annulo hypoxylon. Oh. Oh. Okay. See the one uh, that's that's right in the middle you need a little bit sharper picture but that seems like a possibility these days they are uh, not these days i see it more or maybe i learned that that you crush this material and then it has a reaction with koh so that is another clue for identification. Some of them turn sepia, some of them turn orange, some of them turn red. I don't know if you use KOH. Yeah, uh, anyway. No, I haven't used it, no. Not yet, okay. But you just use one drop? What, what, what uh, concentration do you, you use? Just the 5% or 3%. You crush oh. a little bit of the material on the KOH and it gives a nice color, a nice okay. reaction. For, for, for reactions, you should probably use a little stronger. Oh, okay. than three three percent is good for mounting, mounting oh, okay. spores and things like that. Um, yeah. For reactions, I usually try to use like, I actually use 10% to test oh. reactions, color, color change reactions. Oh, but I use five for everything and I get the reactions. Yeah, five is prop five probably, you know, mm -hmm. they, they tell you to use stronger though. Oh, I didn't know. And that. you can see something even on the black mushroom. You can see something, some a, a color yeah. change. Aha, uh -huh. beautiful colors. Yeah. Great. The the KOH becomes that orange or deep red orange or sepia, like brownish. How do you explain this color change? Uh, the chemicals present in the fungus. Okay, so that was my last, uh, my second and last uh, mushroom. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Herbeck. Thank you. Okay, I uh, have to really to stop sharing.
Oh, all right. Let's see if Mushroom Observer is working again. There we go. Okay, cool. So I found this mushroom yesterday. I got really lucky with the ID on this one. Cuphophilus lacmus. Um, I, uh, I posted a picture on Facebook of my mushroom basket and somebody picked it out of there and asked if that's what it was. Um, I had never seen this mushroom before. It was really cool looking. Someone found it in, on Wells Mills. Really? It's not a very, it's not very common. On Mushroom Observer, there's, there's little to no East Coast observations, mostly on the West Coast. It's got this really cool intervenous mm -hmm. gills. I think it's, I've got a couple observations of this. Do you? There. I think so. Maybe, maybe it's the name because it's sometimes, you know, Mushroom Observer doesn't um, sometimes pick up the changes in names. Oh, uh, it might be an old, old you might have it under I might have called it Hygrosity or something. Hygrosity, yeah. Yeah. Because I was looking at the... You know, I'll have to go on there and look and, and update it. Okay. So, a couple of gray, The gray... Um, Gray gills, sort of. Yep, gray gills. Yeah. The, the top, like when I picked these, these were frozen. <laughs> and by the time I got them home, they thawed out. So these gray gills and the gray top actually kind of turned bluish. Here they are. I think they're starting to thaw out a little bit. Yeah. There's, there's yeah. another one that's pretty similar that's called, I don't know, subviolaceous or something like that, or violaceae something. Pretty similar to lac lacmus. Yeah. Yeah, this, these, are the, these are the thought out pictures. And the spores matched up with the lacmus. So. I was using the, uh, the sets book, their wax cap book. So that was a neat find. There was a bunch of them frozen right on the shore of this lake I was at yesterday. I read know. that uh, Cophophilus, what used to be called, is, is called high growth side by some authors. That's correct. Yeah, they used to be called high growth Hygrophorus. And it was I like, think there were hygrosity. Hygrosity. Yeah. Hygrosity. Hygrosity. And a couple of five. Th this one has really gone through quite a few names. Um, mm -hmm. These mm -hmm. things that are now called cuphophilus. They were camerophilus for a while, hygrosity. A long time ago, they were, I think they were hygrophorus. Hygrosity was a split off from hygrophorus, I believe, quite a number of years ago. And then splitting off from hygrosity was Camerophilus, but for some reason that that genus name got trashed and in, in favor uh, i think it went back to hygrosity for a while and then it went to cuphophilus and i think that's the current standing and the cuphophilus are the ones with the decurrent gills mostly hmm. okay all right cool so Those are the, a lot of them have the inner vein gills too that's a really nice photo you can see the veins in between the gills all right so there was that one okay then right in the same area i picked this um trigoloma pretty sure it's a trigoloma i'm a little less sure about the species oh i'm sorry Never mind, Neofavilus americanus. Okay, so I've been picking a lot of these and looking at a lot of these, um, these Ameri or Neofavilus. So that's the, the poor side of it. And that's the top side of it. Now, the americanus is supposed to be white and it kind of yellows towards the edges. And I'm constantly looking at these and everyone always says it's just an old avularis that's faded. Right, that's what I always, that's the constant explanation I hear. But this thing was like really fresh and leathery, right? Like they seemed really nice and fresh and I got a really good spore print off of it. And my spores, they're really narrow and they're smaller than the avularis by a couple microns and kind of fits into that Americanus uh, size. See, there's my spore. So I did 10 measurements my spores and they're consistently I think Americanus starts at like 11 or 12 and four on the width I'm sorry the other one Avularis. Uh, so. Luke yes 
Americanos supposed to have that white color, white yep. creamy? Oh, yep. okay. Person, photograph, single photograph I have, I, I definitely know is Americanus. They're like pure white. They're really white looking. It's in the paper. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a, in the description, they do say um, as they dry, they become yellow on the edges. Mm -hmm. And they have a depression in here near, near the stipe. The other ones might have too, but um, I don't know. I feel pretty good about this one as Americanus because of the Ooh. spores, because I measured them at a thousand. You know, my microscope's not really a great microscope, um, but if I really want to make sure I'm getting a good, accurate reading, I go to a thousand and use the oil. And I did, you know, 10 spores in the oil on this one to make sure I was really getting an accurate read and felt pretty good about that. I, I keep I keep hearing kind of like you know talk about um there may be some other species floating around out there of neophabulous in our area that this is not described yet. I've I've found white ones that I thought looked pretty fresh. Yeah, it's probably that you were yeah, you did show one a couple of weeks ago, I remember? Yeah. That. And I think your spores were smaller too. Oh I I yeah, I didn't compare actually. I should. Yeah, I should go back and look look that up. She would find that one. Okay, so this is um, I, I was calling this Tricholoma uh, serratifolium, although I'm not 100 percent you know sold on that one. Um, these were under beech trees, I, yeah, under oak and beech, and they kind of had like that corn-like smell to them, like you know corn silk or you know fresh corn. They were just a little bit bitter tasting when I tasted them. So that species, the uh, serratifolium, is supposed to have um, like a um, serrated gills. So I look at this, I was kind of going back and forth, like that looks serrated, don't you think? Or am I just reading into that? Yeah, I, I, I think that qualifies as serrated. Yeah. I mean, the, the teeth are kind of big. That's what so I was like, thinking. Yeah. But I I can't see why why you wouldn't say that. Although some of them over here on the left, mm -hmm. you don't see big teeth. Oh, so agreed. yeah, that's kind of that's kind of ambiguous, I guess. Mm -hmm. So it looks like a tricholoma, though. That's for sure, with the notched gills and just the overall appearance. Right. So there's an. Another one with the gill shots and yeah, the same on this one. This might be the same mushroom, I don't know. Um, you know, over here they don't look they're wavy, but over here starting to kind of look serrated. So I see here he said the spores were lemon lemon shaped. Oh, okay. Wow, cool. Mm. Would you call that lemon shaped? Uh, yeah, I guess you could. Lemon. <laughs> what widely lacrimoid? Even I don't if know. The, even if the apiculus is lateral, lateral. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah, there's more spores. So, I don't know. I put that down as a could be for serratifolium. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe somebody will come in there. Is that one in the Tricholoma book? Yeah, that's where I got that name. Okay, because I never found that. Okay. And there, but, you know, in the Tricholoma book, there is one that has that, um, that specifically says like that corn, this corn silk smell, but it didn't really match up with that one. But it definitely smelled like corn to me. My daughter agreed. I actually got her to smell it. <laughs> All right, these were pretty cool. I always think these are cool. Biospora, Myosora. So growing out of uh, Norway spruce cones.
I'm pretty sure that's what they are. I didn't really, I didn't do any microscopy on them, but I, uh, on any kind of cone. These were on um, Norway spruce. Oh, because I found it, but on the regular, the common white pine. Okay. And they have a lot of mycelium at the base, like big, big cordons. Yeah, if you mm -hmm. look. Yep. There you go, like that. No gills. The mycelium at the base. Okay. See what I'm talking about? That's what you were just saying, big cordons of mycelium all around here? Yeah, yeah, going around, yep. Yeah, that was actually like holding some of these actually on. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm, yep. And these are tiny, as you can tell, I mean, just a couple mm -hmm. centimeters tall. A good yep. bit of them. Okay, this, this one I called a clotosophy, I don't really know. It, Looks like a little tiny clotosophy and it had that deep farinaceous smell. I didn't really get to look into it too much. It was in um, conifer duff. I can't remember if, I think it's a mix of white pine and Norway spruce where I was at. Um, you see, they're kind of somewhat the current gills on them. They're really small. These things were no more than three millimeters. Like that one, I think, was this one here was no yeah. more than. Three mil. I'm, I'm sorry. Three centimeters, not millimeters. Oh, okay. Three, was like, what? Three centimeters, and they're really fragile. They were really difficult. It was difficult to even take this picture. See, there, and there, how they're broken. That's just from my fingers touching it. Hmm. They're really kind of like chalky and just kind of crumbly on me, which may have been because they were older. Hmm. They, they weren't the freshest, but they did smell. They did have that distinct odor to them. Um. And I did get a spore drop out of them. I didn't even get a chance to look up what catastrophe spores even look like. Um, a lot of times they're very small. Okay, what did I put down for these? So these were like in the three yeah, by small. three by six range ballpark. So, um, the only the only catastrophe reference I know of is that big Bigelow book, which I have a PDF of. Does anybody else have a reference? That's not as quite as large, or is that is that the go-to, the Howard Bigelow book? No clue. Howard Bigelow, I think, was the only person that seriously looked at clytoscopy. Dig into that. Yeah, I don't think anybody even tried since he spent so much time with it. All right. And the last thing I have here is this polypore, which I don't have an ID on. So I got a lot of information about it. I thought I would get a little further with it based on everything I could find on it, but these were super neat polypores are tough. Um, yep. It was on pine. It was underneath of a dead conifer, probably a Norway spruce, maybe a white pine, producing a white rot. You know, so I flipped it over and found this, this, this thing. And what was kind of perplexing about it it kind of looks like rigid porous when you first look at it, right? It's got um, like this is the fresher material, this kind of whitish, creamish stuff, um, which kind of bruised orange as you pressed it. And this stuff over here was, I presume, the older stuff, right? Like maybe it started to regrow again. Um, and these pores kind of glanced like an orangish color because the tubes themselves are actually kind of an orangish color. So it's pretty distinct looking. It peeled right off. I peeled it off easily, but when I dug down in the wood, I'm pretty sure it was like a white rot. And you look at Heterobasidium anosa. Uh, no, that's that's an interesting idea though. I didn't. For some reason, that's ringing a bell. Okay. Um. One of the things that was really distinct about this is on this older part, the brown part, when I, this is KOH, 10% KOH, and look how deep of a cherry red reaction that is. But, wow. it didn't, but it didn't do that on this whiter stuff, on the fresher part. And I tried a couple of different pieces. This happened in a couple of different spots on there. You know, this where it's bleeding red is me scraping the KOH down into there, trying to make sure I had a lot of KOH. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but it really, it was a really, Intense reaction there. Beautiful. 
Oh. And I did get a spore drop off of it. So I have spores on there. Uh, three, three, three by four to five to six. So, um, you know, with, with, with a spore drop on it, it's exciting for a thing. And I th think I was looking at clamps here, but I'm not. I'm, maybe somebody else can check. Does that look like a clamp or does that just look like? No, no, it doesn't look like a clamp. It doesn't? No. Maybe just like binding hi-fi? Because it's twisted like it, there are two elbows too close. Okay. So it's probably binding hi-fi then. That's, that's the thing when you get into these resupinate polypores that don't have a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, in, you know, things to look at. It gets really mm -hmm. deep into the hyphae and it's very difficult to discern. You know, they start talking about all this binding and generative hyphae and the way it's wound. And yep. anyway, I thought with uh, the amount of information I got out of it between that KOH reaction, the four sizes that we get somewhere with it, but I really, I couldn't come up with anything. Like I said, when I initially looked at it, I thought it looked like a rigid porous. But it doesn't really match that. You mean like rigidiporos crocatus? Yeah, kind of like no, in, no, it's not. No. No, I didn't. No. no, I don't think it's that species. But you know, it's got the same color to it and the same growth pattern. Oh. You know. But it looks more gelatinous. I remember when I found it. This one is dense. You know what I'm trying to say? The color is dense. The one rigidiporos is um like jelly gelatinous yeah when really? it's white when it's new it's white and gelatinous aspect and when it's mature it's pinkish and it's so hard like rock yeah i know i find it a lot here in my, oh, area, right, okay. in my area but i've never seen it in the gelatinous stage usually it's starting to get pink by the mm -hmm. time i see it mm. but yeah it gets really hard like bony hard like a piece of bone but it has this one that you found has that irregular aspect that um, crocatus has, like elongated and with yeah. like different sonations. It looks a little, yeah, like that. The only thing I could make out to with the um, this bizarre reaction is that must be um, here it is. We're only reacting on this stuff. This must be just a different, like more like almost like a pileus type material, maybe. I don't know, that's got me kind of stumped a lot. The reason why why it's like reacting like that when it's in that area where it's a little older. But I don't know if this is Corinos crocatus grows on conifers because in the park where I go, there are no conifers. The I don't, yeah, I don't think I don't think this is crocatus. I was just saying it kind of oh, reminded okay. me. It was okay. kind of reminding me of a rigid porous. Okay. And and just about rigid porous crocatus. It stains even without KOH. You just make a line and it stains pinkish. And even when it's new, it stains pinkish. Yes, that's what, and that's why I was saying this kind of reminds me of oh. Crocatus because okay. see how it is, see all like this, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. That's just from handling it, bruising kind of a orangish color. So, but anyway, I put it on Facebook. I put it on the crust, the crust and polypore mm. page. So mm -hmm. maybe I'll get a something out of that the shape of the spore is pretty unusual yeah i thought so too yeah i was happy just to get a spore print out of it i tried this thing that larry millman told me um when you put the put it down in your slide he said mm -hmm. sometimes if you put a really small weight i put a razor blade on it like a thicker razor mm -hmm. blade mm -hmm. um you know he mentioned a quarter he said he always uses a quarter if you put a little weight on there sometimes that tricks the polypore into mm -hmm. putting some spores out mm -hmm. Okay, so that was my stuff. I'm I'm all done there. Um, Dave had that um, that piece from Tom, that lichen from Tom. Okay. So here you go, Dave. Cladonia chlorophylla. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Look. It's um. If you click on the confidence there, it looks like Jason must have weighed in on the percentage. Just click on where it says 76%. Yeah, so Jason says Karen is right. Well, that's good. She'll be pleased. <laughs> um, <laughs> she, she did a little bit of work on looking at these photos and trying to figure this one out. The photos are good, though. 
Um, if you do a zoom, you can see a fair amount of, of detail on, um, on these. And in fact, there you can see it varies because it's hard to get focus, you know, continuously across the whole thing because of all the different planes being occupied by, by these structures. Um, it's got a lot going on there. <laughs> it's got a lot going on there, yeah. Yeah, there, there's a lot to look at. So, yeah, she she said she thought it was that. And it was only identified to group. Apparently, it's the group of species. And so Jason didn't come on and get any more specific than that, but he agrees that that's what we should call it. Yeah. And I think you know it looks like it, too. Also? Excuse me? I think also it looks like it. <laughs> OK, good. Um, you know what I'm finding also, and this picture shows it, this photo looks like it was taken in direct sunlight, which I typically try to not do. But I've noticed now really late in the season with the sun very low, I'm, I get better pictures um, in sunlight, probably because of the low sun angle, there's just not enough ambient light uh, for my camera to really focus very well. And it looks like Tom took probably took these pictures in in um, pretty 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 much of full sunlight and it's pretty good detail you got pretty good detail on on these um, so so it's just something to think about when taking photos late in the season as opposed to maybe like in July where if you take pictures in direct sunlight and you know, middle of the day in July, it's just all totally all washed out is, is what I usually end up with. So there, it's a, it was just a cool thing, you know, cool looking like. And all right, very cool. Thanks for sharing. Okay. All right, so I think that wraps everything up. Does anybody else have anything else they wanted to share before we uh, wrap it up? Pretty sure we got to everyone, right? All right, awesome. Well, don't forget everyone tomorrow night, um, John Michelotti doing his- uh, seven? Yeah, seven o'clock. Oh, okay, thanks. You're welcome. Did you get the, do you have a link, Marisol? Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, good. good, okay. thank so you. So tomorrow night, seven o'clock, and I uh, will see everyone next week here at the same time right thank you good night all right thank good night you. everyone bye. bye thank you have a good week bye. everyone. thank you bye